I and Diana were reborn together, but she doesn't know it. She thinks I'm still the same love-struck person from our past life. I provided her with the best material conditions, sent her to the best university, even if it meant bankrupting my family to support her entrepreneurial endeavors. In the end, she squeezed me dry and discarded me when I was no longer useful. And then she had the audacity to bring my archenemy to me, saying that she finally doesn't have to endure the humiliation I brought her with my money. In this new life, I swear I will never give her a single cent again. When it came time to choose a beneficiary for one-on-one -on -one sponsorship, she stood proudly and confidently in front of me. But I deliberately overlooked her and chose the pitiful person next to her. Chapter 1 The annual charity donation event I attended on behalf of Smith. To show our commitment to the sponsored beneficiaries, every year we select one individual from among the many recipients for one-on-one -on -one sponsorship, directly connecting them with our team. In our past life, I was captivated by Diana among the numerous sponsorship recipients. Unfortunately, she turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. This time, before attending, I specifically informed William. He is my archenemy and Diana's unrequited love. In our past life, Diana has mentioned more than once that William had secretly admired her before I started sponsoring her. It was me who used money to hinder their love. This time, let me see if William ever truly saw her before she became my girlfriend, Diana. When William and I arrived at the sponsorship hall, all the relevant individuals were already present. The hall was crowded with about a hundred people. At first glance, I spotted Diana. I must admit, when it comes to aesthetics, my taste is quite good. With a height of almost 1.7 meters, slender waist, and long legs, her cascading jet black hair fell loosely on her shoulders. Among the modest and impoverished students, Diana shone like a blooming snow lotus on a mountaintop. Sensing my gaze, Diana straightened her posture, lifting her chin even higher. I know she, like me, has been reborn. Once the most successful female entrepreneur, now back to being a poor student, I wonder if she has adjusted to it yet. Facing the humiliation that the person she despises the most is about to bring upon her, I wonder how she will react. With great enthusiasm, I walked in. The school representatives were very welcoming, continuously thanking Smith Group for providing underprivileged students with an opportunity to study without worries. You see, even bystanders understand gratitude. But just because of my affection, Diana perceives all my efforts as humiliation. And this time, I have decided to withdraw my affection. I hope she will be satisfied. I humbly mentioned that all of this is only natural, as it is fulfilling the social responsibility of an enterprise. Next, we move on to the next segment. The school officials conducted a round of selection based on various criteria such as academic achievements and awards, recommending 10 candidates. I sat at the conference table, and the person in charge asked the candidates to line up and introduce themselves to me one by one. They were all outstanding individuals, limited only by their financial circumstances, preventing them from reaching further places. Our intention in sponsoring them is to provide them with a boat to cross the first river blocking their path. The individuals being introduced looked at me with gratitude and eagerness. Everyone knows that being chosen as a one-on-one -on -one sponsored student means gaining access to more resources and the opportunity to pursue a broader future. Soon, it was Diana's turn. She was indeed exceptional, consistently ranking in the top 10 academically and receiving various provincial and national awards. The person in charge held high hopes for her and asked her to say a few words to leave a deeper impression on me. But Diana was unresponsive, only offering a cold hello. The person in charge's face darkened. Diana seemed indifferent. She looked at me with arrogance and disdain. In our past life, after hearing Diana's introduction, I skipped the remaining candidates and designated her as the one-on-one -on -one sponsored student. She must have thought it would be the same this time. Unfortunately, I turned to the person in charge and said, no need to force it, let's get to know the next student. Diana hesitated for a moment and didn't leave immediately. The person in charge immediately urged, Diana, please don't waste any more time. Diana gave me a cold glance and walked away. You see, if it weren't for me choosing you, you wouldn't even qualify to stand in front of me. 
I couldn't be bothered to spare a glance and continued listening to the information about the next candidate. After hearing everyone's information, I chose Claire. She hadn't received any awards, but consistently ranked first academically. And she was the only one with scars on her face. It was said that her alcoholic father caused those injuries. She didn't seem to have any expectations until I announced that I had chosen her. She looked at me with timid eyes and said, Thank you. Diana was dissatisfied and sarcastically remarked, Just a bookworm buried in books. Claire pursed her lips and remained silent. But I had no intention of indulging her any longer. To this candidate, are you engaging in verbal bullying against your classmates? I coldly spoke up. Diana first looked at me with surprise, then revealed a subtle expression of, so that's how it is, you purposely did this to get my attention. It made me sick to the point of almost vomiting. Diana, on the other hand, remained calm and aloof. I'm just stating the truth. Which means you don't think you've done anything wrong? I couldn't be bothered to converse with her, so I turned directly to the school officials. These are the candidates you've selected? I have doubts about the character of the recipient of this sponsorship. What I want to support is a future talent who can pass on this kindness. The way this student treats her classmates, with such arrogance and mockery, makes me doubt whether she would lend a helping hand to the weak when she has the capability. I deliberately labeled her and questioned her values. I didn't want to waste my goodwill on such a wolf in sheep's clothing. As expected, my words caught the attention of the school officials. The person in charge quickly stepped forward, demanding that Diana immediately apologize to Claire, or else her sponsorship would be revoked. Diana looked at me with anger. I didn't even spare her a glance. Didn't they say that the money I spent on her was an insult? I wanted to see if Diana, with her inflated ego, would humiliate herself just for that amount of sponsorship. I won't apologize. Diana stood her ground. Don't think that you can make me submit with money. One day, I, Diana, will show you all that women can achieve success on their own. Diana spoke with righteous indignation. Everyone was speechless. So, not sponsoring her is considered bullying? Truly self-centered. In the midst of silence, applause suddenly erupted. It was William. He clapped his hands while walking towards me. A student with such integrity, Ronnie, you can't bully her. William shamelessly spoke up for Diana, trying to accuse me of bullying underprivileged students. Diana's eyes lit up when she saw him. Who knows what kind of romantic scenario was playing out in her mind, where a wealthy young man secretly admired her and bravely defended her under immense pressure. Unfortunately, I could see through the smug smile on William's lips. He just wanted to use Diana to antagonize me. I wasn't as foolish as before, allowing a few words to paint him as a good person. But she was the one who refused to apologize first. I deliberately gave Diana a disdainful look. She defiantly raised her chin and glared at me. I'm not wrong. I pretended to sigh in resignation. Our Smith group would never sponsor someone who doesn't understand the importance of unity among classmates. However, I changed my tone. Since William seems to have so much faith in this student, why don't you sponsor her? As soon as the words left my mouth, Diana's eyes lit up, looking at William with anticipation. But William stammered and looked uncomfortable. In the end, he gave a half-hearted response, I'll discuss it with my family. Ha! He was just an insignificant illegitimate child in their family, and he thinks he can come up with a decision through discussions. But as I looked at Diana, who had a smug look on her face as if she still had William's sponsorship even without mine, I silently chose to watch the show. I was curious to see where Diana would end up this time without my family's support. Chapter 2 Claire and I entered the prestigious Kyoto University. Diana, on the other hand, went to the nearby normal university. Her grades were good enough to qualify for Kyoto University. But normal university offered subsidies, affordable accommodation, and a monthly allowance. As Claire and I were walking, we ran into Diana. She looked down on Claire with a disdainful gaze and mocked, a sponsored plaything. This had happened in a past life as well. 
Back then, I liked her and always found reasons to be around her. Rumors started spreading, saying that she had climbed up the ladder and secured the wealthy young master of the Smith family, ensuring a worry-free life. Once, while I accompanied her to the cafeteria, someone said to her face, a sponsored plaything. Diana's face turned black on the spot. The person who spoke walked away with a smug expression, and Diana turned around, knocking over my tray and shouting for me to stay away from her. The greasy food spilled all over me, and all the surrounding students were watching. I still remember that feeling of embarrassment, wanting to disappear into the ground. I regret not slapping her right across the face in that moment. Who does she think she is? When others talk about her, she gets angry and defensive. But when she becomes the other person, she mercilessly ridicules those who were once in her position. I was about to retort at her. But Claire stepped forward, staring directly into Diana's eyes. You're jealous of me. Her tone was calm and straightforward, her usually gentle face filled with unwavering determination. Diana took a step back, trying to maintain her composure. What do I have to be jealous of you for? Claire took another step forward. You're jealous that I got into Kyoto University and you didn't. You're jealous that Ronnie chose me, not you. You're jealous that it's me standing by Ronnie's side, not you. Claire delivered a powerful three-part attack, and I couldn't help but applaud her. Diana was clearly overwhelmed. After all, she couldn't possibly deny that she chose normal university because she couldn't get into Kyoto University. In the end, she could only mutter, I can't be bothered to argue with you, and flee. Claire then retreated, putting away her fierce demeanor, and obediently returning to my side. Aren't you angry? I asked. I know it's not worth it, Claire replied. Good. At least this time, we ended up with someone who has a clear mind, unlike the previous one who turned into a wolf with just a few idle words from others. Chapter 3 I thought that after that incident, with Diana's proud self-esteem, she wouldn't bother me for a long time. But I underestimated her ability to adapt and manipulate. I was in the library, reading a book, when she approached me. Ronnie, I'm giving you an opportunity to invest in my new energy company. Just give me 50 million, and I'll give you 0.1% of the original shares in the company. Diana stood in front of my desk, leaning on it with one hand, looking down at me with a gaze that held three parts mockery, three parts indifference, and one part charity. She was like a modern-day domineering female CEO. But who asks for investments in such an arrogant manner? I kicked the leg of the table, pushing the chair away as I stood up. You're too close to me. Diana's hand trembled for a moment, but she managed to regain her balance. Good. Although she still made me nauseous to look at, at least it wasn't as suffocating as before. The students around us, who were studying, were interrupted and looked at us with disapproving eyes. I sincerely apologized, I'm sorry, this person from another school was harassing me, and I couldn't hold back. Who do you think you're calling a harasser? Diana raised her voice. The studying students immediately became intrigued and turned their attention towards us. Diana instantly deflated. Ronnie, you're going too far. Diana lowered her voice and threatened me through gritted teeth. I shrugged, indicating that her threats were useless. Diana was furious but had no choice but to negotiate with me. Ronnie, think it through. If you don't invest in my company, don't blame me when your family goes bankrupt. Diana looked down on me as if I were her puppet. I suddenly understood what she meant. Yes, in a past life, I had secretly diverted all the funds from our cash flow to support her entrepreneurial endeavors. As a result, our family almost went bankrupt due to the broken financial chain. It was her breakthrough in core technology during that time that secured new funds and saved us from the crisis. No wonder she always carried herself with such arrogance in front of me. Turns out, she saw herself as our family's savior. But if it weren't for giving her a large sum of cash, how could our financial chain have broken? People like her, even if they're reborn, only remember the outcomes that benefit themselves. The process means nothing to them. Understanding her mindset, I had even less reason to be polite to her. If you want to attract investments, do you have a qualified company? Do you have a team? 
Do you have a business plan? Do you have an investment return statement? A series of questions, and Diana couldn't answer a single one. I looked at her disdainfully. You have nothing and yet you come to me for investment. On what basis? Just because of your face? I clearly meant to mock her. But somehow, she took it to heart and looked at me with a face full of indignation. Ronnie, don't think that having a little money gives you the right to do whatever you want. I will never submit to you. If you won't invest, then forget it. I'm looking forward to seeing you regret it. And then she hurriedly ran out of the library. There was a strange sense of satisfaction in being able to lightly brush her off. But I swear, my only intention was simply not to spend money on her. Yet, Diana still managed to secure the investment. I heard that William helped her find the funds, 5 million, in exchange for 51% of the original shares in her newly established company. Diana instantly became the talk of the school. She excelled in the best teacher training program at the normal university, but those courses were of no use to her entrepreneurial endeavors. She never attended classes. When teachers criticized her for not focusing on her studies, she didn't hesitate to retort, asking them how many years of salary would match the five million she received in investments. After that, no one bothered to interfere with her. I knew about Diana's entrepreneurial project. She was a smart person. In the previous life, she entered the new energy vehicle industry, primarily focusing on battery endurance issues. At that time, I liked her and thought she was the smartest girl in the world. Using my family's connections, I got her into the best new energy science and engineering program at Jing University. She wholeheartedly studied for four years at the university and then, after entering graduate school, co-founded a company with her advisor. And now, she was just a freshman in college. Even if she carried memories from her previous life, having already spent many years in management, far away from the forefront of technology, could she still succeed in entrepreneurship solely relying on her individual research and development? I eagerly awaited the outcome. Chapter 4 Diana organized her entrepreneurial team. She searched for all the people she had worked with in her previous life during her entrepreneurial journey. Unfortunately, only a few individuals with similar qualifications were convinced by her sweet talk and joined her. As for her previous life's advisor, I heard that he rejected her without even meeting her in person. Well, he was a top-notch technical expert in the industry. Why would he pay attention to a poor student from an external teacher training college? But I was different. Using the reputation of being an alum, I happily secured a collaboration with Professor Miller with an initial investment of 30 million. I even managed to include Claire in the team. After all, she was also studying in this field. By entering Professor Miller's team in advance, I could directly pursue my bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in one go. How convenient! Not long after Claire joined, she started sharing with me the complaints of our seniors about Diana. For example, Diana would give orders like, I want all the competitors' data within three minutes. Her seniors struggled to open a data statistics website, clicking and typing away until they reached the step where membership was required to continue the search. Then, they turned the computer screen towards Diana. In an instant, Diana's arrogant demeanor, which was higher than an 18-story building, deflated upon realizing the membership fee. It amounted to a whopping 300000 for Diana, who had Smith as a safety net in her previous life, this was merely a few lines of free background information. But this time, she had to personally experience how expensive fresh data could be. Naturally, the membership wasn't activated. An hour later, Diana provided a few company names for them to check on the status of their new products. However, no matter how much they searched, the data was scarce. There was even one company that hadn't been established at all. When my senior went to report to Diana, she was scolded for half an hour, pointing fingers at her. She said those few companies were industry leaders, so how could they only have such limited information? Too little money for too many tasks. My senior couldn't bear it and had a big argument with Diana, directly quitting the job. When she came back, she complained to Claire and others about Diana, saying she didn't have the fate of a princess, but rather the ailments of a princess. I personally think that's a very accurate summary. 
Diana has always been extremely arrogant. In the previous life, everything went smoothly for her because I kept supporting her with Smith's resources. If she needed data, Smith's strategy department had annual memberships to major professional databases. If she needed plans, she had over a dozen managers under her, each specializing in their own area, summarizing everything for her to present. If she needed technological breakthroughs, dozens of technical backbone members in the laboratory worked day and night, obtaining patent achievements with Diana's name on them. It was these people who gradually bestowed her with the halo. Making her a technical genius and a rising star in business. But she always thought it was her own brilliance that illuminated others. Unfortunately, I was blind at that time and truly believed she was a buried treasure. Chapter 5 Diana's entrepreneurial team didn't last long. Just when they had achieved some results, someone left with the core technology. Of course, Diana called it theft. But in reality, they were just applying for a patent, and Diana insisted on putting her name on it. That person took the technology to a company owned by a wealthy second generation, earning ten times more than under Diana's leadership. Diana couldn't stand it and went to cause trouble at the company. The wealthy second generation pushed her, and she grabbed a vase and threw it at him. Both of them ended up in the hospital. When I received the news, I quickly informed William and we rushed to the hospital together. In the previous life, that wealthy second generation had no intention of letting Diana off easily. I paid a huge price to save her. This time, it's up to William to perform. In the hospital room, Diana was lying alone on the bed, her leg in a cast and hanging high up. On the other side, the wealthy second generation was sitting in a wheelchair, with several burly men standing behind him. Diana's face turned pale. Indeed, it was quite intimidating. Even in the previous life, when I negotiated with them while blocking them outside the hospital room, I felt quite fearful inside. But this time, it was much better. This time, I came to watch the show. When Diana saw me and William, she visibly relaxed. Especially when she saw me, a sense of superiority seemed to appear on her face, as if saying, I knew this man couldn't let me go. Even a kind of dissatisfaction emerged, wondering why she arrived so late. I really wanted to go up and give her a slap, and ask her where she got her confidence from. The wealthy second generation noticed her gaze and turned his head to ask me, are you her boyfriend? I quickly waved my hands and stepped back. I'm just passing by. Diana glared at me angrily, but when she saw William beside me, her expression seemed to have a hint of understanding. I guess she assumed that I was jealous. I quickly moved further away, so as not to be infected by her stupidity. As expected, the wealthy second generation turned to William. William took a step forward. Diana's eyes immediately softened and sparkled when she saw his gaze. Don't misunderstand. We are just ordinary classmates. I see there's a misunderstanding between you two. Just clarify it then. William stepped forward, nervously adjusting his bangs. Misunderstanding? I don't have any misunderstanding. She smashed my head and I came to ask her for compensation. The wealthy second generation disdainfully looked William up and down. William's eyes shifted around, avoiding direct eye contact. The wealthy second generation scoffed. So, are you going to help her compensate? William hesitated but still had that peacemaker demeanor. Not really. Just hoping you can take my face into consideration and ask for a little less. The wealthy second generation stroked his chin. All right. I was originally here today to discuss a business deal worth a hundred million. She smashed my head and ruined it, so she should have compensated me. But for your sake, I'll give her a 10% discount. She can compensate me with 90 million. Brother, I'm being generous. The wealthy second generation made an outrageous demand. William's expression changed, and his face instantly lost all color. I'm not familiar with this classmate. If you have any issues, it's best to discuss them directly with her. With that, without even looking at Diana, he quickly walked out of the hospital room. The light in Diana's eyes visibly extinguished. With no one to intervene, the wealthy second generation continued to glare menacingly at Diana. 
If the compensation doesn't satisfy me, I'll have you thrown in. It was the same in our past lives. Although both of them were injured, Diana was the one who struck first. If the other party insists on not settling, then she will definitely face criminal responsibility. Diana was well aware of this. In our past life, I secretly exchanged Smith's most profitable business line with the wealthy second generation, not only saving Diana but also retrieving the core technology that was taken away from her. This time, she had no money, no power, and yet dared to single-handedly attack their company. Who knows, maybe she even expected me to come to her rescue. Sure enough, Diana looked at me. Ronnie, as long as you help me resolve this matter. I will. I will be your girlfriend. After saying this, she tightly closed her eyes and turned her head aside. As if she had suffered a great humiliation. Poof. In our past life, I was concerned about her injuries and afraid that she would be under too much pressure, so I never told her about the price I paid. But this time. I want her to see with her own eyes what she has truly lost. I deliberately pretended to be moved, eagerly looking at the wealthy second generation, and asked in a very melodramatic tone. Tell me, what do you want in order to let her go? As a result, someone on the wealthy second generation's side recognized me, and their demands for compensation increased instead of decreasing. Oh, it's the young master of Smith. It's my fault for not recognizing you. We're all on the same side, so let's not talk about money, how vulgar. If you want me to spare your little lover, it's simple, exchange it for Smith's retail channels. The wealthy second generation smiled at me. Diana opened her eyes and turned her head abruptly. In our past life, she had taken over Smith, so naturally, she knew what Smith's retail channels meant. This. I pretended to hesitate. Diana's expression clearly began to change. She must have remembered why Smith's retail channels were provided to others free of charge. It was all for her. In Diana's incredibly moved gaze, I smiled wickedly. If she really is my little lover. This money, once I spend it, it's spent. But some people can't figure out their own position and end up being tainted by others. I don't have a hobby for garbage collection. I gave Diana a disdainful look and confidently left the hospital room. It feels so refreshing. Chapter 6 Diana wasn't sent in. The rich second generation didn't want money in the first place. He wanted the project in Diana's hands. Diana was forced to give the entire entrepreneurial team to the rich second generation. Even she herself signed a contract, becoming an employee under the rich second generation. It is said that before graduation, she can only be considered an intern, receiving a monthly subsidy of 1,000 yuan. When William found out, he immediately confronted Diana. The 5 million investment William gave her was obtained from his wealthy sister. Now, not only did he not see any returns, but he also lost all of his principal. That wealthy sister suspected that Diana and the little fox spirit colluded to cheat money, so she broke up with him in anger. William was furious, of course, he had to go find Diana. It is said that the two of them quarreled back and forth for several rounds, and in the end, Diana compromised and signed a 5 million IOU to him. With her current monthly subsidy of 1,000 yuan, she's afraid she won't be able to repay it in her next life. I mocked William in my heart for being stupid. But soon, I couldn't laugh anymore. This shameless Diana actually turned around and targeted me. Early in the morning. I left the dormitory to go to class. Just as I was about to go downstairs, I saw Diana waiting at the door. She held a transparent plastic bag in her hand, with two large steamed buns bought from the cafeteria inside. Ronnie. She saw me and hurriedly came over. Here, your favorite steamed buns. She handed me the buns, and even forced out a smile that she thought was beautiful, but was actually very irritating. I was so disgusted that I almost vomited last night's dinner. Diana is not stupid, she naturally noticed my disdain. She furrowed her delicate eyebrows, looking impatient. Don't like it? You used to. She stopped halfway through her sentence. I saw her anxious look, and coldly sneered in my heart. Used to? That's right, in my previous life. 
It was that time when she threw her tray at me in the cafeteria, causing me to lose face. I endured it and didn't go to confront her for a whole week. It was said that she was targeted quite badly that week and couldn't bear it any longer. The next day, she brought me breakfast. Two cold, large steamed buns. Looking back now, I suspect they were leftovers from the day before. But at that time, I was in love, my mind filled with thoughts of how Diana actually bought me breakfast. It was Diana herself, specifically, buying breakfast for me. I forcefully gobbled down the two buns, even choking on them, but I continued to happily follow Diana. Oh, how I wish I could go back and slap my past self. I don't like eating steamed buns. He doesn't like eating steamed buns. As I turned around, Claire had somehow appeared behind me. She held a pink thermos lunchbox in her hands, with a glass bottle of fresh milk on top. I told you that you don't have to buy breakfast for me every day. I felt a little embarrassed. Not eating breakfast is not good for the stomach. Claire handed me the milk. There was one time when she happened to see me having a stomach ache, and I unintentionally mentioned that I probably hadn't eaten breakfast. Since then, she has been preparing breakfast for me every day, in various ways, rain or shine, without interruption. I took the milk from her. The temperature was perfect, and it tasted really good. Seeing that no one paid any attention to her, Diana let out a cold snort and walked away. As she passed by the trash bin, she deliberately slammed the buns hard. The buns hit the side of the bin and fell back to the ground with a thud. Diana didn't even look back. No manners. I shrugged my shoulders. Wasting food is indeed not good. Claire handed me the lunchbox, walked over to pick up the buns, removed the plastic bag, and placed them where our classmates often fed stray cats. At that moment, I thought she looked strangely beautiful. Chapter 7 Diana didn't give up. She always found a way to unexpectedly appear by my side. Like an persistent fly. During class, she would occupy a seat in advance and wave at me from afar. I directly complained to the teacher, someone is affecting my learning. I went to the cafeteria to eat, and she made me stand in front of her in the long line. I turned around and went to the third floor cafeteria. When I went home on the weekend, she was waiting downstairs, saying she wanted to take a walk with me. I took a step with my long legs and got into the luxurious car that came to pick me up. I was annoyed. Claire, upon knowing this, made more time to accompany me. She was already busy with her own studies and had to participate in the professor's project, so her free time was very limited. But she was always by my side, unhurried. At night, when she finished studying, I walked her back to her dormitory, and we fed the stray cats downstairs together. The kittens were cautious yet greedy eaters. Claire broke the codfish intestine into small pieces and placed them in the palm of her hand. The kittens came over when they smelled the scent. I followed suit. The soft, wet tongues of the kittens licked my palm, making me feel tingly and melting. I'm actually a little envious of a cat. Claire suddenly spoke, her voice low, almost inaudible. I turned my head and saw her shining, moist eyes. Only then did I realize how close we were. Our arms touched, separated only by thin sleeves, and I seemed to feel her body temperature. A gentle breeze passed by, carrying a sweet fragrance. Not the scent of flowers, but the scent of Claire. I involuntarily leaned closer to her, feeling a bit intoxicated. What are you doing? A scream shattered everything. Diana stood behind us, her face contorted in anger. The frightened kitten scattered and ran away. Diana's gaze locked onto me, as if she wanted to pounce on me the next second. Claire stood up and leaned against me. I dropped the remaining codfish intestine in my hand, stood up, clapped my hands, and pulled Claire behind me. What right do you have to come and question me? I had no expression on my face as I looked directly into Diana's eyes. I am. I am. Diana's voice became hoarse, as if her throat was being squeezed. Her expression went from anger to confusion, from confusion to regret, and finally, a hint of pain appeared on her face. You belong to me. She looked at me with intense eyes, as if I were the most handsome guy in the world. Unfortunately, I don't believe that's true. 
Even if it is true, it's too disgusting. I composed myself and turned to face Claire. Go upstairs early. Claire nodded. I'll see you back. Okay. I turned and left. Diana kept calling after me from behind. I kept walking, never looking back. Diana is just a pit of mud. In my previous life, I stepped into it and not only got myself covered in mud but also ruined myself and my family. This time, all I need to do is bypass her. Chapter 8 Diana no longer bothered me. However, Claire continued to seek me out as often as before. Having meals together in the morning and taking walks to feed the cats in the evening became almost routine. Until one day, Claire didn't show up at all, from morning till night. I felt uneasy and asked her senior. Her senior also said they hadn't seen her in the lab and couldn't reach her for the data. I used my family connections to investigate and found out that she left the school late last night and then went missing. Further investigation revealed that the last place she was seen was a dirty and chaotic alley. That place was Claire's home. I remembered her alcoholic father and the scars on her face when I first met her. I quickly gathered people and rushed over. The house was small and dilapidated, with even the walls covered in black. A heavily intoxicated man stood against the wall, holding a bottle of alcohol in his hand. Upon seeing us, he only raised his hand to shield his eyes from the sunlight and continued drinking. Where's Claire? I asked. The man ignored me. The people I brought with me shook him a few times, and only then did he hiccup and drunkenly say, she's been taken away. That little bitch thought she could get away from me. If it wasn't for someone desperately looking for her to repay the debt. The drunkard swayed with the bottle in his hand. Thoughts flashed through my mind, but I couldn't grasp them in time. Finally, someone went up and slapped him twice, and he begged for mercy, revealing the name of the creditor, Jack. I hurriedly led the group to rush over. Jack saw that there were many people with me and only agreed to let me bring one person in to talk with him. Without hesitation, I agreed. Claire was locked in an empty room with a table and a chair in the middle. She sat on the chair, while a big man stood next to her, holding a promissory note. There were visible red marks on her face, and she clenched her teeth, holding back tears, not making a sound. The little girl has some spirit, Jack said, waving his hand and the big man walked away. Only then did Claire notice me, and tears poured down instantly. How did you end up here? Claire tried to get up but was firmly held down by someone. Don't worry, young lady. I see that your boyfriend here has good conditions. Maybe he can help you repay your father's gambling debt, and you two can leave peacefully. Isn't that nice? Jack said. Jack walked over and picked up the promissory note, unfolding it in front of me. Good-looking guy, I can see that you're not bothered by a few million. If you help the young lady repay the money, I'll respectfully send you both away. How about it? I glanced at the amount on the promissory note, over 1.2 million. I'll do it. Without hesitation, I agreed. Claire's gaze dimmed for a moment, and then she suddenly struggled fiercely. Bring me the promissory note, I'll sign it, I'll sign it. Don't go to him. Claire's voice trembled with a hint of crying. I felt sorry for her and just wanted to pay the money and leave with her quickly. But then one of Jack's henchmen whispered something to him, and Jack's expression immediately changed. Oh, it's the young master from the Smith family. My apologies, my apologies. Those few million, let's say it was me, Jack, who looked down on you. Jack beckoned, and someone handed him a new promissory note. The amount was one billion, with a daily interest rate of one percent. Jack pointed to the signature line. The young Master Smith can sign here, and we'll be all good. This was getting a bit too greedy. I pressed my lips together and didn't say anything. Jack's henchmen slowly closed in on us. The bodyguards I brought with me were on high alert. Both sides were in a stalemate when someone broke through the door. It was the police. I had already instructed them to come before entering. The police officers arrived with impressive speed. Jack and his men clearly panicked. In their nervousness, someone grabbed a chair and tried to smash it at me. 
I didn't have time to dodge. But the expected pain didn't come. It was Claire. She threw herself in front of me, risking her life. Chapter 9 Jack was arrested. Claire was taken to the hospital. During the investigation, it was discovered that Diana had called Claire out in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, she insisted that she was only delivering a message for Claire's father. Unable to convict her. Diana gave her statement and left the police station. But both Claire and I knew that she was involved in this matter. While Claire was in the hospital, Diana shamelessly came to visit. Claire had a shoulder injury and was lying half-reclined on the bed. I was by her side, feeding her bird's nest soup. She was a bit embarrassed at first. As soon as Diana entered the room, Claire immediately took the spoon I handed her and drank it slowly, gesturing for more. It amused me. Diana looked at us with a gloomy expression and twisted face. Ronnie, what's so special about her? A gambler's daughter, is she worth it? Or is it that you enjoy playing with the children of poor families like this? Diana seemed to have gone a bit crazy. Her words no longer concealed her rebirth. But her accusations only made me laugh. Playing? In my past life, I risked everything, including the entire Smith family, for her. And she called that playing? But I no longer cared to argue with her. Diana, you're not welcome here. Please leave. I gave her a direct order to leave. However, Diana didn't leave like she used to. She walked up to me, crouched down, and tried to hold my hand. I avoided her. She seemed a bit angry, but she still made an effort to control her temper. Ronnie, don't be mad at me. Let's go back to how we were. If you stay by my side, I won't treat you badly again. Is it okay? There was a hint of pleading in her expression. I purposely smiled at her. And when a glimmer of hope appeared in her eyes, I gently said to her, I don't want to. Just like in my past life, when I begged her relentlessly to spare the Smiths, to spare my parents. She held William's hand and stepped on mine, saying, I don't want to. Chapter 10 Claire recovered quickly. On the first day she was allowed to leave the hospital, she returned to the laboratory. My parents were frightened by Jack's incident. And knowing that Claire saved me, they often asked me to bring her home. I could only run between school and home. Life was peaceful. Until one day, I noticed that my father had a troubled expression. When I asked, I found out that our family's company was facing trouble. A long-term client suddenly got snatched away by someone else. Whenever we went for bidding, our lowest price was always known by our competitors. Even our once proud retail channels were constantly interfered with. And the ones meddling were none other than the rich second generation individuals I fought with Diana. They would tamper here and there, causing annoyance although they didn't cause serious harm to the Smiths. My father grew impatient with handling these trivial matters and left them to me. I knew deep down that Diana was behind all this, using her memories from our past life to play tricks. But it was difficult to find evidence for such matters. So, I had to start with the new energy project. After Diana's team was taken over by the rich second generation team, things didn't go smoothly for them. After facing numerous setbacks, she remembered Professor Miller, whom I had collaborated with. She had been secretly contacting Professor Miller. Little did she know, Professor Miller often shared her stories as a joke with me. Since it didn't work out with Professor Miller, she turned her attention to Claire's senior colleagues. Claire told me that someone seemed interested, but there hadn't been any concrete action yet. Originally, I wanted Professor Miller to remove that senior colleague from the project. But now, I had Claire keep an eye on that senior colleague, not to startle the snake in the grass. The new energy project quickly made progress. Professor Miller applied for a patent under the pretext of collaborative research with his students. Just as the patent was granted, Diana filed a lawsuit against Professor Miller, along with our Smith family. The accusation was that we stole their technology. The witness was that senior colleague who had been bribed by her. Not only that, she even spread this matter online, attempting to tarnish the reputation of the Smith family using the power of public opinion. 
Ronnie, as long as you obediently come back to me, I will drop the lawsuit. Before the court hearing, Diana looked at me with a determined gaze. It's truly laughable. In my past life, I treated her with all my heart, but she discarded me like old shoes. In this life, I suppressed her at every turn, yet she stubbornly pursued me. You're dreaming. I coldly smiled and walked past her. During the court hearing, Diana was arrogant. Presenting various data for comparison, she forcefully claimed that they had developed it first. And we only presented two pieces of evidence. One was video footage. The senior colleague who was bribed secretly copied the laboratory data and handed it over to Diana, which was captured in the surveillance video. The other piece of evidence was the actual core data comparison. The data that the senior colleague copied was not genuine at all. Yet Diana, holding two completely different sets of data, accused us of plagiarism. The judgment result was without a doubt. Furthermore, our lawyer filed a counterclaim on the spot. Diana instigated others to steal the data, which constituted unfair competition. Baselessly accusing us of plagiarism amounted to false accusation. Spreading false information on the internet damaged our reputation. Multiple charges were established, and the case was filed on the spot. Although a verdict couldn't be delivered immediately, Diana, she couldn't escape. Chapter 11 Before the judgment was announced, Diana asked to meet me for the last time. I went. Claire also went, waiting for me not far away. Diana looked at Claire's departing figure and sneered. I never expected you to still like a girl from a poor family. I knew she could tell that I had also been reborn. Forgetting gratitude, repaying kindness with enmity, it's a matter of character, not poverty. I couldn't be bothered to hide it anymore. So, you've also been reborn. We're the same, that's why we're kindred spirits. Diana stared at me intensely. I truly wonder how thick her heart must be to think that I would still have a change of heart towards her. Diana. I rarely call out her name. She looked at me with anticipation in her eyes. I smiled. I don't know if you remember or not, but you owe a debt of five million. Diana's face stiffened. I couldn't be bothered to play games with her anymore. Diana, to see you like this, I'm actually happy. In my past life, it was my love for you that made you always feel superior to me. It was my affection that allowed you to step on my shoulders and reach a place that didn't belong to you. But not only did you not show gratitude, you even found fault with the ladder I provided. If you disliked it so much, you could have just told me. Enjoying all of my efforts while secretly wishing to drag me into the mud. If we could start over, I wouldn't have done anything wrong to you. I just took back what I once gave you. But look. I smiled gently. This is where you were meant to be. Diana's face turned pale, and she slumped down. She could no longer maintain the pride that I had nurtured with countless love and money. Ignoring her despair, I turned around and walked towards Claire. She didn't even spare a glance at Diana, her heart and eyes full of me. I come from a poor family. She lowered her eyelashes, appearing somewhat desolate. I was about to comfort her. But she lifted her face, looking at me with a radiant smile. But I won't be forever. She waved her phone at me, and there lay a text message inside. Your new patent application has been approved. I will use more patents as my ladder and step by step, I'll come to your side. Claire looked at me with a beaming smile. I embraced her slender waist and kissed her passionately.